So Mercedes just put the meeting recording on. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll give you a brief history of my work. So a lot of my work started in Atlanta, Georgia as a teacher. So I worked as a fourth, fifth and sixth grade teacher, became a school administrator um, in the city of Atlanta and then became a school principal and then ended up founding a charter school in the city of Atlanta that was really focused on um, bringing a diverse community together and having conversations about what it means to show up and come to school, no matter what your family looked like. And so we had conversations with our adult members of our community around race and equity and education. And, it was, it was probably one of the greatest honors to, in my life, is to start a school um, from the ground up and really a school focused on um, racial equity, learning equity, um, and community. And, and in the process of, of talking with the DCP community as I was interviewing, uh, what I know about DCP and Downtown College Prep, it, it kind of resonates with my personal mission around getting students access, getting communities access, because I do believe that schools should be a community center uh, and, and should offer as much as we can to families in regards to sustaining their students to and through school, as well as going to, to college and through college. So I'm just humbled to be part of the Downtown College Prep family. And I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. Um, I had several conversations with our staff at the beginning of my journey with Downtown College Prep. And I think it's important for me to answer as many burning questions that you have. Um, and so nothing's off limits tonight. I will try and do my best to answer questions about the program, about the school. If you have questions about me personally, I'm happy to answer those as well. It's really just a, an opportunity to start um, the most important thing in any community is relationship building. So I'm honored to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, so parents, uh, this is the time to begin thinking of your questions. Um, and I would like to kick us off with one question. So um, we know that during this pandemic, there has been struggles and trauma in our community. How do you see DCP continuing to address the needs of our community? Yeah, that's a great question, Mercedes. And, and I, again, I think what's important is, is school is a place for academics, but what we know most importantly is, is school is also a place for building community, for students to socialize, for bringing communities together. And I will tell you, I've been a part of many school openings in my life. And when I was sitting at the Allen Rock Middle School campus in the morning redirecting parents, I know we all had our masks on, but I could see the sense of pride coming back to school, the sense of relief coming home um, to the school home that you all probably missed for 18 to 20 months. So to me, I think it's important to make the school, make downtown college prep not only a place for learning and growing, but a place where students can um, talk through the things that they need to talk through, that they really didn't have this social outlet um, that we all are very familiar with the school. So, so to me, I think that's one of the key things is, is making sure that that School is a safe place to go to. So we know that, you know, from a health perspective that we are following the guidelines and the safety protocol and making sure first off that school is a safe place to go to from a health perspective, a safe place to learn as far as, you know, academically, physically safe, but, but also a place um, that is safe to kind of be fully transparent in who, who our students are at this time, right? And the fact that, you know, there, there have been many things that have happened to us over the last 20 months and, and we, we need to kind of be there in community. And I think that what I'm seeing in the college, in, this, in the downtown college prep campuses is that there's this ability to bring community together.
Thank you. Um, so parents, this is the time to begin uh, putting your questions. You can put them in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and I'd be happy to uh, call on you. Um, I, I do wanna remind uh, parents that um, unfortunately we are not gonna be able to answer specific um, school site related questions. So we'll do our best if we can. And I know Pete is, um, you know, has a lot of information to give us, but um, we're really striving for you to think a little bit more. Um, what would you want to know from our new leader um, and um, any hopes that you might have or concerns that you do have as a, uh, for DCP? This would be the time. Um, so thank you. Vamos a get, oh, yeah, it's been translated. Of course, I was going to go into translation. I, I do see, it looks like Michelle Barry has asked a question about COVID-19 and what are we doing to check the kids, um, have them not work. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that we did from day one is we're offering, we're offering uh, COVID testing at all of our sites. So every Wednesday and you, your student, and I know that we can make sure that we push that out to our families again, but we offer COVID testing every Wednesday at all four sites. And so there's that. Uh, I think we are following all the COVID safety protocols. And I think what we've, what I've learned, I won't speak for us, but what I've learned, uh, Pete Suttlemeyer over the last 20 months is that we have to be, um, Bruce Lee, if you all know who Bruce Lee is, had a famous quote and he said, you must be like water. And I think that what I've learned in the last 20 months is that we have to be like water and we have to make sure that we are, as an organization watching what's going on um, with, with COVID-19 and ensuring that we have everything in place to protect our students to, again, provide them with that safe, healthy environment to go to school in. And then if a case comes up, that we handle that according to the protocols um, established by Santa Clara County Department of Health. So we um, have, I know we have 95% of our um, staff vaccinated. We are asking that 100% of our staff is vaccinated. We are asking that from a staff perspective that our staff is tested. And so especially if they're unvaccinated, we're asking them to be tested every week. And so we are just really kind of keeping an eye on this and um, we're working with, with, our, with our constituents and stakeholders to make sure that that environment is provided for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. I do see Sarai has raised her hand, so I want to give a chance, and then we'll come back to the questions that are on the chat. Sarai, you want to ask your question? I think you're on mute, Sarai. Thank you. Nice <laughs> I do it to meet all the time. You. Nice to meet you. I know. Nice to meet you. Um, okay, so my question might come in like a two-part kind of question. Um, and this is just because of some past experiences, which is where my question comes from. Um, and I'm wondering, I understand that the, our purpose in school is academics, but we also understand that a lot of the reasons why our students cannot perform academically stems from situations that come from the home, that come from their um, surroundings, from their culture, from things that are happening around us. And so with that, with that being in mind and understanding we're in a space where our students are predominantly, um, predominantly low income and we do, our, our culture comes with uh, some generational traumas and things like that. Uh, and so we have built a space like the TCP Parent Coalition, which deals with the academic stuff, but as well with, uh, with resources for families. And so how, how important is it to you to connect with us parents and give us space to also work um, in the form of maybe fundraising for certain events or, or resources we wanna bring? Um, how important is it to you to take us seriously as parents when we speak up about something or when we need something? So, so there, Thank I think you. I have, there, you're welcome. I think there are two questions and, and please tell me if I'm not answering your question, but, but to me, I think a school, a high functioning school provides resources for families, right? And so 
what does that look like? It looks like tapping into there are um, uh, tapping into other nonprofits who can help our families access housing, tapping into other nonprofits who can help our families access food, financial literacy. So, so to, to me, a, a high functioning school needs to be a community center, right? So Sarhi, you hit it exactly is that it's not just about academics because if a child is worrying about uh, where they're sleeping, if a child is worried about where they're getting food, if a child is worried about traumas that they're experiencing, then we can provide the best academic experience for a student, but without providing resources and really identifying those resources for um, the schools, then you know the academic pursuits are, are a lot um, more difficult to attain, right? Because we are we are processing trauma and our students are processing trauma. Uh, I think the other question was about parent voice. And again, I think parent voice, all voices are important to me. I think one of the things that I've learned in my experience with schooling is that we all have we all have our differences, right? We all have our understanding and we all come with our best intentions. My goal is to um, work with all groups, parents, students, um, community stakeholders or authorizers, right? Uh, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, the San Jose Unified School District, and, and really understand that we have differences but what we're focused on is our student success. And so, so I think, you know, I said at the very beginning that I don't want this to be our first time we have this conversation. I'm looking forward to talking with the, the parent coalition. Um, I'm going to, I know Mercedes will share my mobile number and my email um, communication. So I think it's important to have conversations and it's important to seek understanding, right? So my my role right now within these 90 days is to listen and learn. And then from that, think about how we stitch everything that that um, people have shared and different stakeholders have shared and how we stitch that into um, building a better downtown college prep. The foundation is strong. It's beautiful. I think, you know, now we focus on what we have and how we become better. Did that answer your question, Sari? Yeah, definitely. I was really looking for um, seeing how important it is um, coming into a charter school. Uh, there is an expectation there where we we do we do care about what families think and what families want. Um, and so I, I was I was hoping to hear that um, that it is important to you. But you said that every being how, being in communication with everybody is important. So, um, yeah, you did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've received some questions through the chat and I know I have two parents that raised their hand. So let me first, let's do a few questions in the chat and then we'll get to the raised hands. Um, Maria asked on the chat and it's in Spanish, so I'm translating. Um, hi, my question is I'm worried about um, supervision in some bathrooms. Um, there's been concerns on the smell of marijuana um, and how can we be, how can you, uh, and also can there be more strict on the clothes or I'm assuming the, the by clothes, they mean the One. uniform code or policy. So I'll, I'll probably answer the uniform policy question first. What we know is that we, um, cannot legally we cannot require parents to buy uniform pieces so what we can legally do is say that these are the preferred this is the preferred dress code of downtown college prep right so we can't force you to buy anything with our logo on it we can't re we can't require that of you but we can strongly strongly suggest i, I think what we have to understand about community is that they're all, um, we all have different levels of fulfilling that request. And I, I, I think we have to understand that not, not everybody is 
able to, to meet that request in full. You know, I was, I was again at, at Allen Rock High School and was kind of supervising lunch today. And, you know, for the most part, I saw our students in um, their uniform, but I also saw very different interpretations of the uniform. Uh, I, I think uniforms are nice, but I think we also have to focus on the fact that uniforms are not, um, uniforms don't add to the academic success or social emotional success uh, of a student. And so um, I hope that answers your uniform question and in, in kind of the, the worldview that we are forming around uniforms. Mm -hmm. I think in dealing with middle and high school, um, you know, supervision in middle school and high school is, is always one of those things that we have to be vigilant about and that we will not, um, you know, I think the, the core focus of, of all of our staff is student safety. And I noticed that when I was at the high school today and middle schools uh, in the days previous that, that, you know, for the most part, I think our staff is around and, and being vigilant about being present in, in, the, throughout, in and throughout the campus. I think uh, it's, it's harder to answer, to, to say that, you know, we will be able to um, kind of tackle all, all the societal issues that face our middle school and high school students. I think it's, it's up to us though, to help our middle school and high school students understand um, what, making good decisions are around um, behavior and expectations. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, so thank you to Claudia for keeping your hand raised. I wanna turn it over. Claudia, tiene una pregunta or do you have a question, Claudia? Um, yes, I do. I, I do have a question. This is in regards to how we're keeping the kids safe at school. Um, so. Uh, today uh, my daughter was sent home because she there was an exposure at school and so I had to go pick her up today and so you know my that was like my worst fear you know was letting her come back to school was was alarming because it's you know you're scared you know you're scared that you know some kids are either not vaccinated or even if they are vaccinated just because they're vaccinated does not mean that it's going to prevent COVID so my question is is why are students allowed to sit at one table four at a time in the classrooms if the cdc requires that you know we stay indoors six feet apart and that's not being done in the classroom so you know I, and and i see ruth on here and so ruth you can help me with this one or joyce you can help me with this one but but um and i appreciate your question but but what we know with the cdc regulations is as we learn more uh, about the way COVID interacts, there are certain things that, um, that do not apply. Um, and so this, the six feet inside, I don't believe applies anymore. I think it's actually reduced to, and, and Ruth, I don't wanna, or Joyce, I don't wanna jump in here without, is it? Yeah, so there is no physical distancing requirements anymore with um, from CDC and CDPH. Um, they have um, put or they have asked that we ensure that um, there is other safety mitigations like masking, um, hand washing, making sure we're sanitizing. Um, and so again, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can and making sure that there are safety mitigations. Um, um, you know, enforced at our schools. Um, when we can social distance or distance, we do try to implement that. Um, however, you know, as you know, um, our classrooms are a, a building and we can't expand our classrooms. And so unfortunately, um, to ensure that we have students in our classrooms and learning and back in person, um, we do need to just make sure our students are wearing masks, make sure that they're staying home if they're having any symptoms. Um, and uh, we have our weekly testing now um, that is free of charge. Um, it's a very easy nasal swab. Um, and so we're doing that every Wednesday for any of our students. And we're implementing um, 
you know, emergency testing if there if we need to. And so uh, we've got a great relationship with Inspire Diagnostic, who's been doing it actually um, since. Uh, you know, many of the schools have returned back in April. So just again, we're just trying to put as many safety mitigations um, and masking is one of the most um, important. And um, again, just making sure we're doing every we can, everything we can personally um, and as parents to ensure that our, our, our children are um, staying home if they're sick and just symptom screening prior to coming to school. Hopefully I answered your question. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you so much. And um, and with that topic, I know there's been a couple, so I, I just want to put it out there, um, Joyce, and if, feel free to put it in the chat for us, and I can help translate it in Spanish. But there was a question that says, um, I would like to know if, if it is a requirement for students and parents to wear masks on campus because I see on the news a rise in communities around the country that are protesting masks. Also, can parents be tested at the school also? Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for your question. So it is, it is a requirement as far as anybody on a downtown college prep campus must have a mask. So students, staff, parents entering uh, downtown college prep. And I, Joyce, I made you take it off mute and then put it back on mute, but you can answer the question about testing or... Yes, um, currently we have it set up in our system to just uh, test our students and our teachers. Um, there is an option to open that up to our parents and our communities. We just, again, we started school last Wednesday. We initiated this testing last Wednesday. So we were trying to ensure that we had a good system in place to uh, make sure we're getting our students and our teachers tested correctly proper procedures, and then um, hopefully we can open that up soon to our families and our parents and our community, because we definitely want to make sure that we are um, surveillance um, COVID testing as much as we can to um, catch any COVID positive cases ahead of time, so. Thank you so much, Joyce. I'm going to take a question from uh, Coulter and then Julia. Coulter, you have a question? Actually, it's not Coulter, it's Coulter's dad. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know dad. why his name pops up, but it does. Coulter is now going to Davis, so uh, okay. thanks to DCP. Hey, listen, um, Pete, nice to meet you. Thank you. Mercedes, nice to see you again. Um, my family is very active in athletics at the Alum Rock High School. Uh, I help coach the baseball team. Um, both my sons have played uh, multiple sports at the school. What, how, what's your feeling on how to, uh, how, because I have this thing being an older parent that school and athletics were like combined and it was, athletics were very important to the classroom. The classroom were very important to athletics. What's your vision for athletics on, on the different campuses and uh, any ideas on how to maybe expand them a little bit or make them a little more uh, accessible to all the kids, much less the kids that already know about the sports? Thank you, Coulter's dad. Um, I appreciate that question. You know, I, I will tell you that I think, and I'm going to answer, I, I grew up, I played, uh, grew up in Southern California and played water polo. So water polo is part of my high school experience and I played soccer in middle school. Um, so I, I understand the, the important social aspects that team sports give and, and really the, the soft skills that team sports build. I, I, I think when it comes to athletics, it's a very expensive endeavor for schools to, to fund. And so I, I'm going to give you kind of my holistic overview of downtown college prep and, and kind of our, our fundraising um, strategy that is that is in the midst of being kind of worked out as we speak, but but I think what what we do as an organization is we look for programs that impact um, students universally, and so we look for funding opportunities that impact students universally. Um, at the school level, we want to start to develop um, fundraising plans 
that can help schools kind of identify um, activities that will kind of help uh, focus on the needs of that particular community. So, you know, at Allen Rock High School, if, if athletics is going to be one of the things, then how do we help um, the high school, Allen Rock High School, El Primero, um, the two middle schools, El Camino and Allen Rock Middle School, how do we help them fundraise for kind of specific opportunities for, for their schools altogether? So uh, it's, it's an important, I know that, that Allen Rock High School has a strong kind of sports um, tradition. And so I think it's important. I think we just have to figure out how to, um, what's going to be universally beneficial for all of our students and I think academics, social, emotional support are, are kind of our two, two focus areas first, and then thinking about what are those other supports that we can, we can layer in and fundraise for, for athletics department and, and universally um, accessible team sports for, for our students. It's, it, and I think that that's a longer um, conversation. If I could just if I could just follow up, uh, as Mercedes knows, we've uh, Alum Rock High School. A couple of years ago, we started uh, a booster committee for the parents to get involved in helping with the sports and the athletic endeavors. And just like you're talking about fundraising, figuring out ways to bring more money in to help support the different teams, the different coaches, staffs getting equipment, like you said, because it's very, it's very expensive to do that. And with COVID, that just kind of fell by the wayside. And some of the most of the parents that were involved, their kids have now graduated. But we're, you know, as a group, we are on your side to help you in those endeavors. And it doesn't matter where it is, getting the word out to the parents and the, the students that there is a sports activities, and that we can support them. Yeah, and, and that's great. I, I think that that's really important. And, and it takes a group of committed individuals, especially when it comes to, to kind of pursuing these opportunities, especially in athletics and funding. So happy to carry on the conversation with you and the administration teams at the high schools and middle schools. Thank you so much. Okay, I have um, a question from Michelle, and then I'm coming back to you, Julia, who have, um, I'm not, I haven't forgotten about you. Um, Michelle's question is, how does the school help to build student resilience when they are experiencing the increase of mental health distress during the pandemic and even when school is reopening now? You, you know, that's, that's a great question. I, I think one thing that led me to downtown college prep is the amount of social emotional support that we have at each of those campuses. You know, I previously worked for a education nonprofit that worked with Eastside Union High School District and the Allen Rock School District. And, and I am not, um, I'm not disparaging those two school districts, but because of the way things are allocated, you know, their, their counselors are dealing with, you know, 2000 students to, to one counselor. So I, I think really the, 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 the forward focusing of downtown college prep prior to Pete Settlemeyer getting here with, with Ruth and Amy, Dr. Fowler and all the other team focused on, on providing mental health supports for students is important. I know that um, it was a long conversation with our, in our pre professional development prior to starting school is how do we support students from a social emotional perspective? Because you know, let's face it. I think everybody entering each campus at Downtown College Prep, we all are coming. Even those who are joining us right now, we all are coming with some trauma from from this um, these last twenty months that we've lived. And so, I think our I know that our our staff is tuned into that, and that we have the the right personnel in place to to help our students with that with that trauma. Resilience is such an interesting term because I think that we can, we can provide support, 
but I think about resilience as kind of our individual individual capacity. And, and so, you know, resilience comes from having great teachers and adult role models. You know, all of you who are showing up show me that you are strong adult role models in your, in your child's life. And so I think we have to think about how collectively we pour into students and, and um, allow them to have, to, to build their individual sense of resilience. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, Julia, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, hi, Pete. Nice to meet you. So I have a hope and a concern. So my hope is that our neuro neurodiverse students can be a little bit more prepared when it comes to the beginning of the school year. Mm -hmm. For example, a week prior to, or when we got our schedules, I had no information of who my daughter's case manager was going to be. And if anybody knows what it's like to have a neuro, neurodiverse student, their anxiety level is 10 times, you know, on a scale of 10 times more than any normal person. So my hope is that DCP can get better at either communicating with the students or parents or like when they get their schedule, at least we know who their case manager is and how we can communicate with them. Um, I was able to get that information from Micaela before school started. And I thought that that was gonna be enough for her. And this little girl just amazed me. She asked if she can go to the Lobo lab and she introduced herself to her case manager. And she comes back home saying, I think it's gonna be a good year. I wish that all the other students can have that or just prepare them so then they don't feel at ease the first day of school. My concern is with not having enough hand washing stations for these students, um, because last week she did mention that because of how long it took to wait in line to wash her hands, she only had five minutes of lunch to eat. Um, so, I mean, I would really like for us to be able to get some hand washing stations outside for not only her, but everyone else as well. I, I see Joyce and Ruth nodding their heads. So first off, thank you for that question. I um, appreciate you sharing about your child's anxiety. I can imagine too that as a parent, if your child's anxious times 10, that you're probably anxious times 100. And, and so I appreciate you sharing that with us. I think, excuse me, <clears throat> communication is something every organization can do better. And so I think when we have these conversations about um, opportunities to improve communications, this, this dialogue that we're having is important um, so that we are aware of where our community, our communication opportunities are. And so I appreciate you bringing that up as well, because I think as much as we can be proactive, we need to be proactive. That means connecting um, schedules and connecting people with caseworkers. You know, I think the one thing that I've also learned in schools is that, um, and, and you know, this is, it doesn't me, need me saying it, is that we are dealing with with human beings, right? And, and so, and it's not a factory, right? I think schools used to be thought of as a factory, right? You know, you go in at kindergarten, you come out at 12th grade, you go on to college. That's how the kind of fa factory mentality works. But what I've seen both at downtown college prep is a, this very human aspect of the work that we do. And, and so there will be um, opportunities for improvement but there's also opportunities for us to, um, to kind of understand that every time we work with an individual, the, that individual's needs are important. Uh, you know, I think in special education, students come to us with an individual education plan. It's known as an IEP. And, and to me, every student, regardless of uh, neurodiversity, 
needs to have an IEP because every student learns differently. We have 1600 students. We have 1600 students that learn differently. And it's, it's the great um, focus in education is how do I, as a teacher, how do I, as a school counselor, how do I, as a school administrator, meet each of their needs? And, right, we also have to meet the needs of those adults and those family members who are caring for their, for their growth. So I, I share that hope with you, Julia. Thank you, Pete. Um, we have Rosa who asked a question in Spanish, so I'm going to translate it in English. What are you going to do to improve the security uh, or security or safety of our schools? And when I mean safety, I mean inside of the schools and outside. Um, the drop off for students and the pickup for students. And I know there was also a second question about um, a concern that there were some students that sometimes they gather in large groups as they're doing either drop off or at release time. And what can DCP do? You know, I think that that's for our operations team to work with our, our school operations managers to make sure that, um, you know, we can look and, and tweak our process. I think. We, we've opened with a process and, and sometimes there's iteration and change, but it also takes a community to, um, to gather together. So when parents are dropping off, you know, there's gotta be this shared understanding, right? Of, of the drop off and pickup procedure. And, and sometimes we don't have that shared understanding. You know, I've, again, I, I've, been to many schools and I, and I think probably one of the common problems outside of the cafeteria if you have a school cafeteria where where students are having lunch together and the noise volume in a cafeteria seems to be the problem at a lot of schools and then you know the the drop off and pick up and so first off I think we can can look at that with our our um, SOMs at each school and in, in partnership with Joyce and Ruth to see where there are tweaks we can make in our procedures but I also think it, it, it will be important that the community also um, participates in this, this kind of understanding that, you know, you go in one way, you go out the other way. When students come in, they, they are health screened as they come in. So that could be what could appear as a student gathering. I know we're screening all of our students as they come in for health and safety concerns. So there's that process too. You know, we've added a lot We've added a lot of operations to our normal school day. So what happened in March of 19 is very, very different than what was taking place in August of 2021. And, and so there'll be some growing pains because what we did up until March 19th was pretty, you know, uh, muscle memory, right? We all understood that these are the things we did. We've opened school in a very, very, very different um, atmosphere. And so it's going to take the community um, working together and having these conversations and bringing concerns up, but also, I think, um, understanding what what our responsibility and when, or what my responsibility is in this, right? So all the individuals that that are on this call are students. Um, it's about building that um, interdependence where we kind of how do we depend on each other to to um, make us better thank you pete um i have one last question and just um, want to remind parents um if you have any last thoughts please go ahead and put them in the chat or raise your hand we have a few more minutes for a couple more questions um Mari says what's the protocol school what's the protocol that the school's going to follow if a student tests positive for covid and then she also have a had a follow up question on why can't dcp provide um independent desks for students instead of tables sorry these i know these calls these questions are a little bit more about safety but i want to honor that parents are asking oh. Absolutely. And, and 
I'm going to ask Joyce and Ruth because I, they'll look at me and shake their head. So I'm going to ask the experts. So this is kind of what's that game show where you can phone a friend? I'm I'm phoning two friends right now. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, I don't know if I'm an expert, but I definitely am trying to uh, learn and evolve with the uh, ever-changing COVID uh, demands um, and the changing um, uh, mandates that the county is providing us. Um, but when there is a COVID positive case at a school site, um, the first thing is that the, we ask the families, of course, to notify um, our schools. Um, the schools have a um, very clear step on what they need to do um, to notify. I am the COVID designee for DCP, and so anything COVID related will come to me. And so from there, we decide on what um, scenario we need to follow. Um, there's many different kinds of scenarios in COVID situations, depending on if you're um, the student's vaccinated, if the student um, is symptomatic, if they're not symptomatic, did they wear a mask, were they in a cohort, were they non-cohorted? So there's many different layers and questions and scenarios that we need to follow to ensure that we're taking the correct steps. Um, and so once we, once we identify the correct scenario that we need to take, um, then we start to draft the letter and the communication, not just to our families, um, to our students, to our staff. And so you can just imagine the amount of um, work and, and time that takes. And so um, we are doing the best we can to ensure that we are um, doing everything in a timely manner. Um, again, uh, DCP has designated myself as the COVID designee. And so, um, and Ruth um, Shriver is my backup designee. And so between the two of us, we literally drop everything and we focus on um, ensuring the safety of our students and communicating what we need to communicate out to our families. Um, and then we, um, uh, follow next steps. We also then we need to report to our county um, any COVID positive cases, and then we get more direction from them depending on the situation. So um, that's kind of like the big picture rundown. Um, Ruth, if there's anything else you wanted to add that I might have overlooked or not said. I think the only thing I would add is, um, you know, right off the bat, the first thing we try to do is isolate any person who might have symptoms or who um, who tests COVID, uh, positive if they're with us on campus. But most of the times um, the exposures that we've had have come from somebody uh, was exposed outside of DCP. And so uh, typically we are, we are having a family calling in and saying their student tested positive or their student was exposed to somebody else who tested positive. And so what, what Joyce is talking about, the scenarios, they're coming from what the California Department of Health is advising specifically for schools to do. Um, the state is wanting to try and make sure that students are on campus as much as possible, because um, as somebody was asking earlier about social emotional um, impacts and, of COVID, um, one of those things was that students are best at school. And so if they can be safe, and if the science shows that they can be safe at school when they are masked, um, the preference and the requirement actually is for us to try and keep them in school. And so we are working very closely with the public department of health using these protocols to make all the decisions around, um, you know, when are the students quarantined, and then how can we modify the quarantine in accordance with the, guide, uh, the guidelines if they test negative in the beginning and also five days after. So there's, there's a whole ton of um, paths to follow on the flowcharts, which is what uh, Joyce is describing. The cases that uh, somebody was referring to earlier today um, took a, a, a whole lot of staff to like make sure that we called all the families that were impacted made sure that we contacted staff that were impacted and, um, and put into place the things that we need to do to make sure that students um, have access to independent study, 
Um, and so it's, it's a whole lot of effort from our team, but also just want to assure you that we are making sure kids are isolated. If they show any symptoms, that would be the first thing we would do. And I believe um, you've all received the guidebook that um, Joyce and her team put together around all these protocols. And so that's also another source of information about what we are doing on the ground with respect to ensuring the safety of uh, students on campus. And I'll just add just kind of a real life example of, you know, Ruth and Joyce shared that, you know, there was uh, a case on campus today and I, I was on campus and immediately Ruth and Joyce were on the phone. The school administration was working. So it, it is um, it is something that that we are highly aware of. And we are really truly just the fact that that people are dropping everything, as Joyce mentioned, to make sure that student health and safety is is the utmost importance for us and um, just truly impressed because I you know was at lunch duty and all of a sudden made aware of this and and saw the wonderful DCP amazing team go into action to, to take care of the situation so and it's hard to share I know it's hard as a parent because you don't get purview into everything you don't get to see everything. There's not a big camera on the school, but, but I was impressed with the, the lightning speed that people reacted to that. Yes. All right. We have answered um, all of the questions that parents have typed in. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Oh, I see Michelle Berry did, did clarify. Yeah. Um, the screening of students when they enter campus. Uh, the, sometimes there is a large group uh, waiting, um, but she's just wondering how many people are screening students as they walked in. Yeah, I, I believe it depends on the campus and, and the personnel that they have available. Uh, you know, I was at um, Allen Rock Middle School again the very first day of school and saw the, the process. And, and even for the first day, you know, I think it's one of those things that we will continue to be to be um, diligent and continue to improve, right? Again, it it's this this muscle memory, right? We've done things prior to March 19th, like I said earlier, that became part of how we got to school and how we arrived and how we left. And now there's just some new ways that we're all going to have to learn um, that how we can arrive and and uh, that muscle memory will build, but it takes time to to build muscle. So. I still haven't been able to build muscles so. So I see the question from a parent about which campus had a case today. Um, we had uh, a couple of cases at Alam Rock Middle and Alam Rock High School. Every uh, impacted parent, so if your student was a close contact, you have received a phone call and um, only those parents that were directly impacted got that letter. So if you didn't get a letter, your student was not a close contact to the identified case. Algunas, so, sorry. Any other, I was gonna speak in Spanish. Um, Alguna otra pregunta antes de cerrar nuestra conversación con nuestro nuevo. I want any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Mercedes. This is Eva. Yes. Uh, I talked to you today hours ago. I got the job. Oh, <laughs> hi, Eva. Welcome. Hi, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I like the way Mr. Mr. Settlemy is speaking. And yes, we are humans. And yes, we are um, prone to be resilient, right? So um, I want to give a little tiny, tiny little quick testimony. Um, I did have COVID in February, and we we're in August, and I want to tell every, every parent out there that it wasn't easy for me, but um, I'm safe now, I'm alive, I'm over it, my kids are safe, so we go. Respect each other, care of each other, and um, 
I'm here, you know, this afternoon telling every parent that there's always a second opportunity in life. And thank you, Mr. Settlemeyer, for coming into DCP. You know, you seem like a great person. Um, I'm about to graduate in two semesters from Pacific Oak. Talk about challenges, right? So um, I got the job today and I'm happy. I'm happy to have my job again here in San Jose. And we go forward, parents. We go forward. Thank you. Ava, thank you so much for sharing, and it's yeah. great to uh, to meet you. And hopefully, when we're on campus together, you'll come say hi. So, so yeah, I know yeah. I know we're coming to our time, and like I said at the very beginning, this will not be the first time. I think uh, Ava, I appreciate that you know you said forward or onward together. I sometimes will sign letters that'll say onward together because we have to be. We have to be connected in this work. It's so important. Um, it's why I do this work. And, and we're not always gonna get it right. You know, I think as parents, we make mistakes, right? As, as people, we make mistakes. It's how we learn and how we move forward, right? It's how we learn and how we move forward. And if I approach something, I, Pete Settlemeyer, approach something where it's my way or the highway, or I'm always the, the, the one um, in the right position without seeking first to understand and to listen, then we're not gonna move forward, right? Because it becomes my agenda rather yes. than what, what the agenda is for the, for the community. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I am truly honored to be part of this community. Uh, I am, I, I wake up every day excited to, to come to work, um, to see the students. I think that's why I came back to, to schools, just to be in direct service to students and parents and teachers and staff. Uh, and so, you know, I'm available and, and you know, this is, this is a journey, right? This is a, when we think about um, racing, right? And we just saw the Olympics and we know that sprint races get done pretty quickly but marathon races take a long time um, and they're really kind of thought through, right? A runner will pace themselves through that 26.2 miles. Uh, and so we're on a marathon, right? We're on a race and, and we're going to continue to have these conversations. We're gonna to continue to have times where there'll be some pain points, but we're gonna have times that we're gonna celebrate. And I think to me, again, walking onto a school campus and seeing what I've seen in the last four or five days that we've been back together, it's, it's truly impressive. And, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can continue this. I think we all know the outside forces that we face every single day. Um, and so, you know, walking that journey together is, is important, understanding the, the world that we are currently living in, because uh, we have to make this world better for all of the students that all of you represent, right? And we have to give them the ability and the resilience and the knowledge and the social emotional skills that they can make this world better than we're living it in today. And I, I know to me, that's a possibility. I can, um, can like the happy endings, but in my lifetime, I know it's possible. And, and, uh, again, I'm so happy to be here with you, and this will not be the last time. Mercedes, do you have my contact information? Yes. So Mercedes is going to put my contact information up. I um, will. You'll have my email address. You'll have my mobile phone. Um, so, you know, it's. I can answer grand questions, right? When it comes to um, talking about what's going on with your student individually in your school. I will tell you the best way to do that is following kind of that communication with the teachers, with the school administrators. I, you know, I really am making myself available so we can kind of talk about the big, the big issues, right? And talk about how we make DCP, which is already a phenomenal place 
even better. And we do that by walking together. So you have my cell phone, uh, you have my office phone, you have my email. Um, and again, this won't be the last time that we come together. I'm looking forward to talking to the Parent Coalition. I'm looking forward to just meeting people out in the community when we can do that and when people feel safe. So thank you for your time. I see we're over because I have lost mucho. <laughs>